Thank you, Nicola. It's really an honor to be here and I gave the Marvel lecture. Uh, so we're going to look at the future of electrochemistry. When I gave the, the title, so Natia was a little ambitious uh, with a really broad definition of electrochemistry. And in this talk, uh, we're going to look at uh, uh, in the context of electrochemistry for energy storage. So electrochemistry uh, is everywhere, right? And essentially <laughs> in corrosion, right? In uh, neuroscience, in sensors, batteries, and fuel cells. And we study and utilize electrochemistry uh, really by standing on the shoulder of giants. And there are many giants of electrochemists in Switzerland, so we, we utilize Tafel slope, which is really related to electrochemical kinetics uh, to essentially uh, to the rate of electron transfer by controlling the voltage. Of course, we have uh, Hubert uh, Gerald and uh, Michael Grazzo uh, in the room. By very honored uh, to actually be inspired by the work in the past decades. So our climate is changing. Our uh, planet is changing and uh, essentially we need to reduce uh, CO2 emission uh, in order to combat climate change right and this challenge is getting harder right because getting uh, 2050 we're going to have 10 billion people 2 billion cars and uh, essentially we have a very large sea level rise right and so essentially we need to think about uh, ways and technologies that we can essentially reduce the CO2 emission, right? And uh, so in terms of combating the CO2 emission, address the CO, uh, address reducing the CO2 emission, address the climate change, we think electrochemistry or using electrochemistry uh, as an enabler for storing electricity from solar energy is the key to develop a sustainable and a more resilient energy infrastructure. And this is particularly exciting at this time when the electricity cost coming from solar or from wind is competitive relative to electricity we can generate uh, through conventional means. Right? So we're really on par. This is a cost of approaching 10 cents per kilowatt hour for essentially electricity or solar panels installed uh, on the rooftops, right? So you, if you, I learned from Hubert that if you install uh, solar farms, the price can be even lower, right? So essentially we have this really free electricity, right? And so how do we utilize the free electricity or free energy in our transportation and also uh, empowering our buildings? The challenge with renewable energy they are intermittent, right? So what you're looking at is really uh, the availability of solar or wind relative to essentially the demand of load. You can see they don't coincide with each other, right? And this is essentially requires a load leveling so we can actually have a utilization of renewable energy a day and night. And so if we think about storage, right? So energy storage and electrochemistry provide really very efficient means to store electricity. And over the past 200 years, that really um, researchers or scientists, engineers has changed the chemistry, right? From a redox of metals in aqueous uh, electrolyte to redox of metals to non-aqueous electrolyte and to redox of elements essentially uh, not involving metals uh, but involving ligands, essentially utilizing the right-hand side of the periodic table. And it's a way to drive uh, higher energy density, essentially energy stored per unit weight and energy stored uh, per unit volume. Right? So this is really the trend that we see going uh, with lithium ion battery is the dominant player and towards essentially hydrogen other uh, sustainable fuels that can potentially provide a greater energy uh, or uh, lower electricity cost right so lithium ion battery is the technology of choice uh, for cars right and this is related to uh, the rapid reduction in the system cost of lithium ion batteries in the past decade Right. And so lithium ion battery uh, in the next uh, decade uh, will be the technology of choice uh, for electric vehicles, for hybrid or plug-in vehicles. 
and it's also starting uh, 2016, it becomes uh, the technology dominating installation uh, for stationary power applications. So again, that's going to be a major uh, technology of choice uh, as well. Now, moving forward, right, so let's say we want to not only store uh, energy on the level of gigawatt hour, we want to uh, store energy on the order of, let's say, terawatt hour. Essentially, cheaper electricity would be needed, right? So this is where hydrogen, other form of sustainable fuels is very important, right? And this is with the availability of cheap electricity from solar, Right? with a development of cheaper energy storage technologies, batteries, and fuel cells, and also with all the investment excitement with electromobility, uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, machine learning, AI, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things and smart systems. Uh, and uh, these components combining these development excitement together, we think in the next uh, decades, really uh, we have opportunity to transform how we generate energy and how we utilize energy, potentially from moving away from fossil fuels, which is centralized energy water infrastructure, uh, to a decentralized uh, distributed uh, energy uh, food and uh, energy food and water on demand, right? So if we can actually have this decentralized, distributed, uh, utilizing uh, renewable energy and energy storage and electrocatalysis, we can actually develop a more sustainable and resilient uh, infrastructure, right? So for example, as you have seen, uh, Hurricane um, Harvey that have left uh, uh, people in Houston essentially uh, without water and also electricity for days. And just again, this is because uh, our society is built on centralized uh, infrastructure and having distributed system will make uh, energy uh, and our use of energy more resilient. So this is one of the uh, versions, uh, scenarios that uh, my group uh, generated. So uh, starting uh, this year, we're going to generate uh, with different uh, group members to generate a, a vision of life uh, in 2050, right? So essentially, we have this house that's going to be powered uh, either through fuel cells using hydrogen uh, or uh, fuels uh, coming from, let's say, CO2 reduction, utilizing energy from solar and again the cars will be powered uh, through the liquid fuel or batteries uh, through the solar uh, and uh, we are going to uh, very ambitious the, the vision is to have uh, electrochemical generation of ammonia, uh, which is fertilizer, right? Then you can actually have uh, uh, in-house uh, distributed uh, food uh, generation of growth, right? And so this is, again, uh, a vision that, uh, that people have come up with and I think is within grasp uh, if uh, we can actually significantly improve uh, the energy stored uh, per unit volume or weight, uh, or uh, another way around is reduce the cost uh, per energy stored. So what we're going to focus on next is a, a central component in order to, to enable the making of sustainable fuels and chemicals. Right? So we can actually have electricity come from a solar, Right? So you can actually split, store the electricity by splitting water and generate hydrogen right, as an energy carrier. Or similarly, one can reduce a CO2 to make liquid fuel, uh, ni uh, nitrogen uh, to make ammonia, uh, or reduce metal oxides to generate metals. And all these species uh, can be viewed as a sustainable fuel. Right? And during this step, you can see the common uh, half cell reaction is oxygen evolution reaction. So once you have the generation of the fuel, right, you can combine them with uh, oxygen in fuel cells, in metal air batteries, so potentially in flow batteries, to generate electricity and reform these species uh, in equilibrium with our ambient conditions. And, uh, and during this step, you have oxygen reduction. So you can see that essentially 
uh, electrochemistry of oxygen is critical to all these processes, whether you're utilizing metal, hydrogen, uh, CO2 reduction, or nitrogen as, a, uh, as your energy carrier. Right? And uh, what I would like to highlight also, utilizing these technologies, we can potentially store three times more uh, energy per unit weight relative to uh, lithium ion batteries. And this is uh, really the technology uh, to be examined and uh, developed very seriously if we want to really store energy at scale. Right? And also uh, to utilize these type of energy um, uh, storage for a seasonal uh, or very large uh, um, long time uh, storage. So the challenge with these technology is the kinetics of oxygen uh, reduction, oxygen evolution, are very slow, right? So this is shown schematically in this graph with the voltage, which essentially measures the efficiency uh, of your conversion as function of a current, right? So once you pull a current, you see the energy you generate is actually much less what you can obtain thermodynamically, right? So you lose energy during the electricity generation. Now, during the storage step, right, you're putting the electricity in chemical form uh, during charging uh, generation of the hydrogen, you lo also lose energy, right? So essentially, if you uh, complete the cycle, one would want to minimize uh, essentially the shaded area in order to increase the efficiency of such technologies. So this is essentially the loss you'd be looking at if you want to uh, utilize hydrogen uh, as a, a sustainable fuel right, as to store your energy. Right? So just put in perspective, uh, the round trip efficiency for such technology is on the order of, let's say, um, 60%. And this is in contrast to lithium ion batteries, which is uh, rated at 90%. So we want to make these technologies, these conversions, uh, much more efficient. Right? So this is essentially the, the process that common for all the conversion of hydrogen, CO2 reduction, nitrogen, and the also metal oxide reduction. Right? So now if you want to do CO2 reduction, and many of us, us would know that CO2 reduction, that even more challenging, potentially even slower than the oxygen reduction process. Right? And if you're going to do ammonia reduction, that's also a kinetically challenging process. Right? So if essentially you, to make, let's say, ammonium electrochemically, you'll be compounded by the slowness of a reduction uh, involving nitrogen, but also uh, with the oxygen evolution reaction. So we really want to develop catalysts that we can uh, in improve the efficiency uh, of these processes. Right, so you can actually uh, would not waste so much electricity uh, when you store the energy like, uh, in the chemical form. So we want to use catalysts. Right? So catalysts uh, work simply by interacting uh, rather strongly with uh, the molecules so that you want to uh, actually catalyze the reaction. Uh, through the interactions with the surface, uh, then essentially you reduce the barriers uh, that uh, uh, essentially the reactant will have to go through uh, to become product. So there is many hundreds of years of, um, if you will, hundred, at least 100, more than 100 years, 150 years. Uh, BSF is funded uh, based on the, the uh, making of ammonia, and uh, BSF is uh, over 150 years. So there's a lot of studies on how to design catalysts. Right? So one approach of designing catalysts to, is to look for uh, design uh, descriptors. Right? So really, what is the uh, activity descriptor or parameters that can influence uh, the activity by many order magnitude? Right? So the idea would be if you know that parameter, right, and then you can actually tone that parameter um, through varying the chemistry or that particular parameter that can, you can enhance the catalytic activity. Right? So uh, for the past, uh, let's say, over the 100 years or so, research has correlates very often its activity on the vertical axis with some uh, parameter on the horizontal axis. And the horizontal parameter uh, often influences activity by many order magnitude. And so the horizontal uh, parameter uh, is really called uh, activity descriptor. So you can see there's many for uh, metal oxides, for metals, and uh, where uh, very often we utilize either 
uh, parameters that are empirical um, or estimated based on experimental data or computed uh, binding energy of, uh, uh, let's say, absorbates uh, on the surface. Right. So this has made a significant uh, contribution in our thinking of the reaction mechanisms and also in a design and discover of a new catalyst. So what do I like to do is to take an uh, example of a perovskite. Right? So this is in the context of perovskite uh, oxide. Right? So perovskite has found many use in our lives. So Perovskites exhibit, uh, for example, superconductivity to the electron gas, and recently it's the hardest material uh, for solar cells, uh, and also exhibit, for example, ma uh, class of magneto resistance. So a number of really interesting, rich uh, chemical, physical properties. And what uh, we're going to focus on is really a perovskites, how, what do we know about perovskites, perovskites oxide, in the context of uh, catalysis, right? In particular, perovskites play a very important role in today's uh, energy infrastructure uh, as it can uh, catalyze essentially uh, CO to CO2 in a catalytic converter. Right? and also can uh, catalyze uh, NO to NO2. Right? So it's a very uh, interesting and uh, very uh, active surface for reduction of air pollutant. On the other hand, we're going to look at examples how we can play with uh, perovskites uh, there where we can actually use it very effectively uh, as a way to catalyze making of sustainable fuels. Right? So let's say in the case of uh, uh, water uh, splitting uh, in the context of oxygen evolution. So, Classically, we think perovskites or oxides uh, using ionic model, right? So there's uh, many studies that uh, essentially looking at uh, a filling, a EG filling of the metal ions, typically metal transition metal ions uh, within the perovskites and relate uh, the, the amount of EG filling uh, to the catalytic activity. Right. So know that perovskites, essentially you have the transition metal that's bonded with six oxygen, so you're in the MO6 configuration, and then these octahedra, essentially they share corners and then form a cubic or pseudo-cubic lattice. Right. So what uh, typically believed is that uh, the active size is related to uh, MO5 on the surface where essentially you have um, the uh, EG orbitals that can interact uh, uh, coming directly uh, off this uh, particular uh, metal sites that can interact uh, very strongly with adsorbates. Right, so uh, for example, the classical example is uh, how, uh, let's say, the CO uh, may interact with, uh, let's say, the MO5, the EG orbitals, right? So basically is uh, with the sigma donating and the back donation, right? And uh, so in this context, one would think that the amount of EG or the antibonding electrons you may have uh, for the transition metal uh, can influence the CO catalytic activity. And you can see from these previous studies that essentially if you have EG of uh, near one, you have the highest uh, activity. Uh, too little is not good, too much uh, is not good either, right? So the general understanding is that uh, you have too little, then the binding is too strong, then you become poisoned. And if you have too much antibonding electrons, the binding of CO will be too weak to obtain the optimum activity. And similar arguments or trends has been also correlated uh, with these uh, hydrocarbon oxidation activity as well. Right? So EG uh, is a very interesting uh, parameter to tone. Right? So you can actually tone the EG through either substitution or by changing essentially the A site in the perovskite in the chemical formula of ABO3. And similarly, and um, very recently, uh, research has shown that if you control the EG filling, right, you can also increase, um, if you decrease the EG filling, right, from 1 to less than 1 to 0.5, you can significantly increase the NO oxidation activity. And uh, about five uh, years ago that we took this concept and we relayed the EG filling of a number of perovskites 
uh, to the oxygen reduction activity in the basic solution. Right? Again, the message is still the same, that when you have EG close to 1, that you have the maximum activity. In this case, that uh, the data points near the top essentially are a manganite, uh, lanthanum manganite-based uh, oxides. So this is very compelling, allow you to, to rationalize the observations, right? Uh, but it's in fact, the estimation of EG filling is very challenging, right? Because EG filling not only is dependent on the oxidation state, right? But it's also dependent on the spin state, right? So very often, we don't have actually effective way to measure what's really the spin state uh, of uh, really transition the metal on the surface, really what's the coordination uh, on the surface. So there's really no direct measurement of EG uh, on the surface. On top of that, uh, EG uh, concept derived from this ionic model, right? So it doesn't really take into consideration of uh, the covalency between metal and oxygen. And we know that for many uh, late transition metal uh, oxides, uh, covalency or hybridization between the metal oxygen bonds are very important to its electronic structure and to its physical properties. Right? So clearly, EG doesn't capture that. And uh, in addition, that uh, in utilizing this idea of EG, that only the transition metal ions can be the active site. Right? Without taking into consideration oxygen, right? uh, when we have very covalent metal oxides, that metal and oxygen can share a density of states near the Fermi level. Right? So oxygen can become the active sites. Right? So this idea or concept does not take into consideration of oxygen could be the active sites. So for the last few years, uh, we have uh, taken uh, a approach that let's look at really the electronic band structure of the oxides, perovskites, uh, as example, right? So we look at essentially band density of states near the Fermi level, unoccupied uh, and occupied states. So for the occupied states, typically you have um, metal D and oxygen P, and uh, uh, it's really the relative energy difference between the D and the P describes the covalency of the metal oxides. And generally speaking, as you go from the left to the right of the periodic table, you increase uh, the covalency. So what we've uh, been doing is to correlate essentially uh, the, the changes in the electronic structure and align with the redox potentials of uh, reactions we're interested, either hydrogen or CO2 reduction, uh, or oxygen uh, evolution or oxygen reduction. Right? So you can actually look at uh, uh, energetic uh, barriers and the conditions uh, for different catalysts for various reactions. We can correlate the band structure with CO and with NOx and of course with uh, these uh, electrochemical uh, reactions. So the idea we began first is let's look at computed oxygen p-band center relative to its Fermi level, which is a rough measure of uh, a metal oxygen covalency. Right? So it's really what is the band center of oxygen uh, p relative to the Fermi level. Right. And then what you see is that as you change the covalency uh, or the oxygen p-band center, you can significantly change the bulk properties. Right. So let's say the vertical axis is the energy penalty to create bulk oxygen vacancies in the perovskites. Right. And uh, as you can see, as you uh, essentially move the Fermi level into the oxygen p-band, uh, you uh, reduce uh, the uh, energy penalty. It's much easier to create oxygen vacancies. Right. So clearly, uh, creation, generation of oxygen vacancies uh, is getting easier as we increase uh, the covalency. So we're going to relate these changes in the electronic structure and changes in the bulk defect chemistry to two reactions. One is uh, oxygen evolution in basic solution. Essentially, um, either you do reduction of oxygen, essentially O2, to form hydroxide ions, or you do evolution as hydroxide ions and become O2 in a um, liquid-solid interface. Uh, and also, we will look at a solid-solid uh, oxide interface where we can uh, essentially look at the reaction between O2 and O2 minus. And this is generally called surface exchange uh, 
uh, surface oxygen exchange kinetics and the key reaction that we utilize in sensors and also in solid oxide fuel cells and solid oxide electrolytic cells. So we're going to look at these two reactions and relate to the oxygen P-band center. Right? And so um, as we know that uh, we need to, for the oxygen exchange, we need to have start with oxygen to make O2 uh, two minus, uh, O2 minus. Right? So oxygen vacancy uh, very often is reaction intermediate. Right? And so it's not surprising that we see as we uh, lower the Fermi level, make creation of oxygen vacancy easier, then we increase essentially uh, the exchange kinetics uh, by six order magnitude. Right? So now we use abbreviations. So let me translate. We're going to see a lot of these abbreviations later. So LMO is lanthanum manganite, LCO is lanthanum cobaltite, this is L L C is lanthanum strontium cobaltite, lanthanum strontium cobalt iron oxide. And so you can actually just uh, move up in essentially different elements of substitution. So BSCF is barium strontium cobalt iron oxide. So different versions of uh, uh, substituted uh, perovskites. Right, so one of the reasons we use perovskite is it has a, such a flexible uh, chemistry that essentially can put half or more than half of the periodic table into uh, the perovskite structure. Gave you a tremendous amount of flexibility. Right? Now, if you look at the reaction kinetics for oxygen evolution in the basic solution, you also see a very similar trend. In this case, um, changing these compounds, we can uh, essentially changing these cobalt uh, perovskites that we can actually increase the activity by two order of magnitude, right? So it's very interesting, right? It's very different reactions, right? One is a solid-solid interface, the other one is solid-liquid interface. You can see that a common uh, bulk parameter, metal oxygen covalency or oxygen P-band relative to Fermi level, controls the reaction kinetics, right? So this is computed, right? So the question is, can we verify it, right? So can we verify with measurements? And so we uh, utilize uh, X-ray emission spectroscopy uh, at a synchrotron at uh, ALS, uh, advanced light source in Berkeley. So we can actually measure the oxygen K edge uh, emission and also um, the, the metal L edges and align them onto the common energy scale and also align them uh, onto the uh, absolute energy scale and then through which you can actually determine uh, the experimental oxygen P-band center. And you can see that there is a, a reasonably good agreement between the computed and uh, uh, experimental measured oxygen p-band center and so you can of course plot um, the OER activity oxygen evolution activity as function of uh, the measured p-band center and there is a general a correlation where essentially uh, as you move up uh, in this direction you increase uh, the activity right so we can verify this computed uh, descriptor Right? Uh, now, the question is, when the uh, activity descriptor work, or when activity descriptor correlates with activity, right? we want to ask the question, why do the, and how do the activity descriptor work? Right? And uh, they may not be uh, operating by changing, for example, the binding of different reaction intermediates. Right? In the experiments that we could be changing the different oxides that we're examining, we could be changing the reaction mechanism completely. Right? So correlate uh, doesn't uh, always uh, is the causation. Right? So we also want to uh, you know, look at uh, uh, there are many activity descriptors proposed. Uh, we've seen that from the previous slide over the past 100 years, right? which uh, descriptor is really uh, the most uh, useful or predictive and ultimately the question has to be you know what is really the active site right how do we define active sites under operating conditions right so if we look at the trends that uh, we, we had oxygen p-band and we if we try to explain the trend uh, with a conventional reaction mechanism which is this four step electron proton coupled reaction steps so i show essentially three uh, schematic of the reaction mechanisms they're essentially the same mechanism just drawn differently and this is from uh, the uh, chemical physics 
uh, community, right? So it's really the DFT people always use this type of mechanism as schematic. And this is um, a schematic that drawn, uh, published by John Goodenough. And the difference is, is uh, of course, experimentally, we can always assume we have absorbed O2 on the surface without any evidence. Where in the DFT, that we never have the absorbed O2 because in the DFT, that this species is not stable typically, right? And uh, and this schematic is drawn uh, by the uh, inorganic uh, chemistry community, uh, where essentially very similar uh, schematic, and this represents uh, really these electrodeposited uh, metal oxides or uh, oxy. Um, a hydroxide uh, species uh, that can catalyze uh, oxygen evolution. So then the main idea is if you utilize these conventional uh, reaction mechanism uh, would be how would you essentially changing the binding energy between the sorbates and then the metal, right? So you have OH bind to B and then you have O bind to B and then you have OH and OO, right? So, so then we can actually look at how the oxygen p-band center influenced the binding, right? So there is influence a very nice uh, correlation. But then, if you look at the experimental uh, measured uh, potentials versus uh, theoretical potentials uh, predicted uh, through this type of mechanism, uh, the agreement uh, is not very good, right? So, so this suggests uh, perhaps this. Uh, conventional coupled uh, electron-proton um, reaction scheme may not be the sole uh, or the single mechanism operating uh, among all the oxides that's been examined. In addition, uh, recently there are uh, increasing evidence that oxygen on the surface of perovskites can participate uh, in the oxygen evolution reaction. So this is one uh, example where you can look at uh, an array of uh, lanthanum cobaltite, uh, where you can substitute the lanthanum with uh, strontium, essentially with uh, uh, two plus um, ions on the a site, increase the uh, cobalt oxidation state. Uh, essentially, here is the strontium cobaltite. Right, so as you go this way, you move the Fermi level uh, into the oxygen p-band, you make the compound much more covalent. Right? And when you do this, and you do oxygen evolution with uh, the oxygen uh, 18 labeled metal oxides, uh, you will find as you increase the metal oxygen covalency, uh, you see the oxygen that evolved as uh, uh, oxygen 36 or oxygen 34. Right, so if you only have the oxygen coming from water participating in the reaction, we will be looking at O32. Right? The fact that we have 36 and uh, 34 is because the oxygen, because note that uh, the metal oxide has been oxygen 18 labeled. Right? So if you have any um, um, abnormal oxygen that come from the metal oxide. So this shows a clear evidence of participation of metal oxides uh, uh, in the evolution for highly covalent compound. And having oxygen as active site is also supported uh, by the simple uh, DFT analysis looking, utilizing the conventional scheme. So if you have a conventional scheme, you do the four electron transfer, uh, coupled the proton electron transfer on the metal side, and uh, you can look at uh, what voltage when all the four steps are going downhill thermodynamically. Right? Or you can do exactly the same four uh, steps, but on the oxygen. Right? And you can see for strontium cobaltite, essentially you have the same voltage, either on metal or on oxygen, same voltage that uh, you can have all the reaction going downhill, meaning the metal and oxygen have similar activity for oxygen evolution. This is in contrast to lanthanum cobaltite, where you can see the metal cobalt is much more active than oxygen. Right? So this further support that uh, you could have oxygen uh, on the surface without creation of oxygen vacancies that you would be generating O36, uh, O34. On top of that, for the very highly covalent metal oxides like strontium cobaltite, um, Persadinium beryllium cobaltite or lanthanum strontium uh, cobaltite, these oxides also exhibit pH dependent oxygen uh, evolution activity uh, on the scale of a reversible hydrogen electrode. 
meaning that the kinetics is very much dependent on the pH. Right? So that has uh, to do with how the surface may interact with the basicity of the oxides, how they may interact with OH right? uh, under these conditions. Right? So that's true only for these highly covalent oxides where they have oxygen participating uh, on the, uh, in the oxygen evolution reaction. Right, where for the standard materials, a lanthanum cobaltite is pH independent. Right? So this pH dependent OER activity right, can uh, raise question about whether we have really the proton electron coupled reactions. Right? Because if you have these two reactions always coupled without a chemical step, then you will not have really pH dependent oxygen evolution kinetics. Right. So, so this uh, is really interesting, right? Because this uh, basically we have evidence of oxygen participating in the reaction. We have pH-dependent kinetics, and both observations cannot be explained by the conventional mechanism. Right. And so now, if you say, well, I just want to look at this from a practical point of view. The practical point of view is that uh, uh, if you uh, can activate oxygen in addition to the metal oxide, you can uh, clearly, uh, through the example of uh, cobalt-based perovskites, you can increase the oxygen evolution activity uh, by an order or two order of magnitude. Right? So we want to explain why right, um, the highly covalent uh, oxides will have higher activity, right? And then why, what's the difference relative to the uh, lower covalency uh, oxides, right? We want to see is that a new mechanism or they operate with the two different mechanisms, right? We look for clues from their electronic structure, right? So as I mentioned, we can measure uh, the occupied states, we can uh, measure the unoccupied states. So this is oxygen K. And then we can align them on the absolute energy scale, right? So essentially, this is your density states for oxygen, and you can align them uh, relative to redox of oxygen, right, in the solution, uh, O2 to water. And so what you can do is by varying a different chemistry, right? So you can actually lower the Fermi level, right? Uh, and this is very covalent because now at the Fermi level, you have both the states of metal and states of uh, oxygen. And so by measuring uh, tens or 20 of these compounds, you can essentially look at what is uh, the measured unoccupied states, right, which are these white bar, and the gray bar is the Fermi level, and then the black bar uh, is really the oxygen p-band center. Right? So this is all measured at advanced light source, and this is uh, an example of a few selected compounds that we have examined. Right? And uh, so take this data, in order to simplify, we want to create a few energetic parameters to work with. So one is that you can look at the difference uh, between the, uh, essentially this energy level uh, due to creation of the ligand hole, right? And relative to the oxygen p-band center, right? So this is uh, referred as a charge transfer energy, right? So the energy that costs when you move electron from metal to oxygen. And so this is a charge transfer energy we're going to compare across these oxides. You already can see from this raw data that is going down as you go from the left to the right. And then the second parameter we're going to look at is the electron transfer energetic barrier, right? So if you want to do oxygen uh, evolution, you need to oxidize the water, right? So we need to have electron transfer. Uh, so then essentially we want to look at what's the energy uh, barrier between the redox of oxygen, which is this dashed line, relative to the unoccupied state, right? So that's this yellow uh, uh, line here. And then last is this blue uh, energetic parameter, which describes uh, the basicity of the oxide, right? So when you have the Fermi level oxide is lower than the redox potential of the oxygen, then there's going to be changes in the uh, hydroxylation of the surface, right? So that is a parameter that's very important for the um, ease of depersonation uh, for the oxide surface necessary for oxygen evolution. So you can take the energetics, 
just follow uh, the colors. So if you uh, look at the energy versus oxygen evolution activity, this is um, the oxygen, uh, this is charge transfer, and this is electron uh, transfer barrier. As you can see, we have two regimes in this area, going from chromium to, let's say, manganite. Uh, you reduce both energies, and then you increase activity. Now, these are semiconducting oxides. As you go from the left to the right, you reduce the charge transfer, become more metallic. And these oxides on the right, they're all metallic oxides. Right? And you can see in this range, there's a little change in the um, barriers with charge transfer energetic uh, of electron transfer, but activity also increased by or one order magnitude. And this is coupled with a small change in the energetics for the, uh, the oxide the basicity. Right? You can also find a support for uh, what these parameters mean. Right? So for example, you can correlate the charge transfer uh, energy with the oxygen vacancy formation uh, energy penalties. Right? So the lower uh, the charge transfer energy, right? so the easier you move electron from metal oxygen, the easier it is to create oxygen vacancy. Right? So this makes sense. And if you lower this uh, electron transfer barrier, you will see your TAFO slope going down. Right, so this also uh, makes sense for different oxides. And uh, this hydroxylation um, parameter correlates with the pH of zero charge. Right? So you can find uh, physical properties uh, that you can correlate with these bulk electronic parameter. So putting it all together, what we think uh, is happening is that uh, when you move essentially the metal these states closer to the oxygen P, right? So you make them more covalent to lower charge transfer, right? And what you uh, are doing essentially, phenomenologically, we know you increase oxygen evolution in basic solution, also increase activity for surface exchange. And then the idea is essentially that you move the D states closer to the P states. You're making not only the metals active sites, you also make the oxygen as active site. Right. So, so as you move down, move the metal down to increase the covalency, essentially we have change in mechanism. If you look at, this is a change in charge transfer, right? So for high charge transfer gap material, we have electron transfer limited regime, right? Uh, with very high barriers, right? And then you reduce charge transfer and the barriers disappears, right? And so, so in this region, we have electron limited uh, oxygen evolution, and then in the middle we have uh, electron proton uh, coupled regime. And then when you go to this region, metallic oxide, where uh, getting deprotonation from the surface is very, very difficult, right? Because approaching of OH minus to the surface is difficult because the O is negatively charged. So you can actually, in this region, you have proton uh, transfer uh, being uh, uh, limiting the oxygen evolution kinetics. So, so this is essentially, experimentally, we think as we vary the oxides, we're changing the mechanism from electron transfer limiting to coupled reactions to proton uh, relimiting reaction. Essentially, we are varying the reaction or changing the reaction mechanism uh, and through which changing the uh, oxygen evolution kinetics. The trick would be, you know, how would you uh, work with the electronic structure of the oxides, so push it so that you have very covalent bond between metal oxygen, but the, the oxide is uh, still uh, stable. Right? So in the case of, for, for example, the barium strontium cobalt iron oxide, if you do oxygen evolution, actually the perovskite structure is not stable. A site barium strontium will leach out from the oxide. You form a uh, porous uh, oxide uh, structure. Right? So fundamentally, you no longer have uh, oxide uh, have perovskite structure. You form an uh, oxyhydroxide type of structure. Right? And that practically increases activity because you have a lot more uh, active surface area to play with. Right? But uh, fundamentally, we, we want to uh, you know, keep those uh, oxides separate when we do these uh, mechanistic uh, studies. So this type of uh, electronic uh, structure uh, uh, study also have implication in other fields. Right? So this is one example I'm going to show that in the previous case, increasing metal oxygen covalency uh, is really good. Right? So it can increase our activity. 
right? And in this example, I like to show in lithium ion batteries, right? So lithium ion batteries operate by shutting lithium between graphite and uh, some transition metal oxides, typically cobalt, manganese, and nickel oxides. Right. They have very similar electronic structure uh, to the perovskites that we have seen uh, previously. Right? So essentially, as you uh, charge the battery or delithiate, that you oxidize the transition metal, move the Fermi level down. And uh, what we can see that uh, with the oxide surface, when you charge the oxide to high voltages, let's say your cell phone, laptop has been charged to 4.5 volt, uh, versus lithium, right? So it's very high. At this voltage, the oxides is close to evolve uh, oxygen uh, from solid. And uh, you can see that uh, what, what uh, as we move the Fermi level um, downwards, we can actually um, increase significantly the activity of the oxide uh, to oxidize the electrolyte used in the lithium ion batteries. Right, so what we're looking at is a carbonate, uh, uh, EC, ethylene carbonate molecule. Right, so essentially the activity and the driving force uh, increase uh, substantially. Right, and this is really we, we think is the key to, um, to understand the reactivity between the electrolyte and oxides and also potentially provide clues uh, as to what uh, oxides you may want to passivate uh, the surface um, uh, during, uh, uh, for, the, for the prolonged uh, cycle life and also for the safety of the batteries. Right. So, for example, these data points you're looking at with low activity, these are all uh, two plus metal transition metal, two plus uh, rock salt structures have very limited uh, actually activity uh, with the uh, carbonate uh, solvent. Right. So now we've seen you know, a lot of activity descriptors and changing different mechanisms, but how do we use it, right? So where, what, what is next, right? So we can first utilize these design principles and uh, to, uh, in a essentially wider uh, compositional space, right? So we can do discovery of new compositions, uh, potentially with higher activity or higher uh, stability, right? So this is where uh, utilizing advanced uh, statistical methods or so-called machine learning, where you can look at uh, a wider space and to do a new composition uh, guesses. Right, so that's one uh, case, uh, and also you can use this method to uh, compare uh, essentially uh, different uh, descriptors proposed. Right, so there probably you can pick um, a dozen of activity descriptors for oxygen evolution kinetics, and uh, you can actually see which one is the most predictive one. And one of our recent studies uh, utilizes this method and showing EG and covalency across, uh, you know, these. Uh, limited type of studies uh, still the dominate uh, descriptors and correlate uh, m with the reported data uh, well. Right? And uh, going beyond this, right, utilizing uh, AI or machine learning, these methods, we can actually also do fundamental studies, right? So to, to explore the space of the, in different mechanisms that allow, or different uh, composition space, allow us to uh, even gain further insight uh, into mechanistic details. So we're very excited about uh, utilizing uh, these uh, computational tools um, in our research. So I want to end with uh, one example is our quest to define active sites. Right? So far, as we're looking at bulk electronic structure, and the assumption is the bulk electronic structure will influence uh, surface um, uh, chemistry, surface defect formation, uh, surface essentially um, uh, energetics. Right. But we really want to define, ultimately, the active sites uh, under operating conditions. So our approach is combining electrochemistry institute techniques and DFT to get at a surface. So the example we'll be looking at is performed on uh, very s simple single crystal um, uh, surfaces, either prepared by pulse laser deposition or just grown as a single crystal. And fortunately for rutile structures, right, like ruthenium dioxide uh, is a, a material that uh, single crystals uh, are available uh, widely, right? So what we do is uh, we perform this called, uh, this technique called uh, a surface um, 
surface X-ray scattering, right? So uh, you can actually collect the so-called the rod or surface truncation rod. Uh, these uh, essentially peaks uh, you're looking at, and so what we can do is you can run a CV, right? So this is current, this voltage, and you can collect data at the different points. Right, so what uh, is interesting is that uh, you can actually have some rods that are only coming from the diffraction um, of ruthenium. So basically, as you change the voltage, nothing happens. But then there are other rods that are very sensitive to oxygen scattering. Right? And uh, so then essentially, it's function of voltage is sensitive to surface absorbates. Right? So either you have water, OH, or O on the surface, it's going to change its function of voltage. Right, so what we can do is to take this data and fit the structure. So on the Rutel uh, surface 110, right, most well studied surface, you typically have two different types of ruthenium. One is called cus, and the other one is bridge. Cus is undersaturated, this MO5 type of uh, configuration. Right? So this is cus here, right? and this is bridge, and this is cus. Right? So as we walk through the voltage, first you note the oxygen are these right ones. Right? So oxygen is actually going down right, as we increase the voltage. And this has to do with the initial these oxygen are water. So you have water. You think of water here. And this is the OH. And then as you increase the voltage, these guys become OH, and this one become O. And then at this voltage, everybody's O. And then now at oxygen evolution voltage, what we note is the evidence of it absorbed O2 molecule or peroxyl species on the surface, right? And this is previously uh, typically believed uh, that uh, um, it's not stable on the uh, metal surfaces, right? But there is uh, uh, evidence uh, that we can actually, we need to fit with this structure in order to explain the changes we see in the CTR data. So we want to support this thinking right, using DFT right, to see what, to what degree we can actually have. So that you, what you're looking at is a computed surface uh, poor bay diagram at different voltages in agreement with experiments. You know that first you have essentially absorption of water. And then the water is hydrogen bonding with this um, OH here on the bridge side. And that's uh, in this uh, voltage. And now if you increase the voltage, you have this uh, essentially a transition where you actually have uh, OH here and uh, so this is uh, OH and water and here is uh, OH and O. Right? And you can further do analysis at a higher voltage so it's here you have O and then you have OH and O and then further increase the voltage uh, you actually get two configurations where the uh, the O2 molecules can be stabilized on the surface using DFT. One is you have the O2 configuration and the, with hydrogen bonding with OH uh, on the uh, bridge side. And or you have a configuration, you have alternating O2 and OH on the cus side. Right? Either configuration, you'd be able to stabilize the O2. Right? So then if you look at uh, from this scheme as you change the voltage, right, increasing the oxidizing voltage, essentially the surface gradually oxidizes the water right, on the surface from water, OH, O. Right? So that's responsible for the so-called pseudocapacitance you're looking at. And where uh, on the surface, right, so one could argue whether the cus site of ruthenium's active site or the oxygen on the cus site, the oxygen is the active site where it essentially uh, create this precursor uh, with the reaction intermediate before the oxygen evolution. You can further do um, a computed oxygen evolution mechanism uh, using the conventional um, proton electron coupled steps, right? So you start with a cus site being a vacancy, then you put the water, and then you gradually essentially deprotonate. You're looking at the free energy changes. And this is at uh, 1.5 volt. This is where uh, this uh, catalyst can be seen to generate oxygen evolution current. And uh, essentially what we see is uh, when you have this O2 stabilized on the surface, it, it has a uh, thermodynamic barrier relative to oxygen evolution. And that's what we think is, is actually stabilize uh, these O2 on the surface.
Right? So this uh, provides a, a mechanism or direct evidence that O2, molecular O2, or O2-like uh, species that can be stabilized on the surface and there's a barrier uh, for uh, the oxygen evolution. Right? So doing this type of study, we think it would uh, um, provide uh, Im immense uh, insights into what might be the reaction intermediates and uh, how the surface really interact with uh, the solution. Right? So this is where is a beginning that like there's a lot we could do by varying the surfaces of the, these oxides, also by varying the solution. Right? So there's immense space in chemical physics of liquid that we can vary and see how the liquids also influence essentially these surface interactions and through which understand the, their uh, influence on the kinetics. So I want to leave this slides. We think it's very exciting to use computational tools and also uh, advanced techniques to, to allow us to, to know more about the mechanisms, active sites, and do material discovery and uh, to enable this uh, sustainable um, uh, distributed uh, energy infrastructure we discussed earlier. So I want to just thank the people I work with. Uh, so the study that I've shown um, mainly was performed by Alexei Grimo, um, by um, by Wesley, by Wesley Hong and also by Kelsey, uh, and the ruthenium oxide work uh, by Reshma Rao, and the work would not be possible without collaboration with our, uh, Mark Cooper in using dams, and the Oxygen P-Band Center uh, was first uh, introduced uh, in collaboration and with the leadership of Dave Morgan. Of course, we work very closely with the beamline scientists, and many hours, and many uh, really years of uh, collaboration in order to collect the data that needed uh, for this type of uh, mechanistic studies. So I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>